Hey everyone, and welcome to the Horaces panel on fostering the post-COVID financial system. I'm Gina Chan, Washington columnist for Reuters Breaking Views. We're lucky to be joined by a distinguished group of panelists who have a wide variety of experiences. You can learn more about their bios in your program, but we'll just do a, a quick introduction here so you know who is speaking as we kick off the discussion. So first we have uh, Rishi Kosla of Oak North Bank. Rishi, if you could just raise your hand so people know who you are, thank you. <laughs> Next we have uh, Venkat Matori of Institutional Advisor. Thank you, Venkat. And last but not least, we have uh, Robert Scharf of uh, Luxembourg Stock Exchange. And uh, we may have somebody else, Victor Guiche of uh, Bitsy, joining us later uh, if he is able to make it. Uh, but first, we wanted to kick off the conversation with sort of a broad question about what we've all seen, good and bad, uh, of the fallout from this pandemic and what that means for the financial system uh, going forward. So first, I wanted to throw it to each of you, um, what you see as the biggest risks and the biggest opportunities, which I know um, may seem like they're, they're not out there as much given um, some of the uh, horrible inequalities we've seen uh, as a result of the pandemic, but there, I'm guessing, has to be some good hopefully coming out of the bad. So I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on uh, both the biggest risks and the biggest opportunities as we uh, hopefully come out of this pandemic and what that means for the financial system. And Rishi, if you want to kick it off for us. Sure, absolutely. So let me let me start with some of the positives, at least as I see it, right? Um, through Through the pandemic, you had so many organizations do things at such speed and execute things in terms of how they actually managed clearly internally, but how they also managed their clients and how they interacted with clients and the innovation which got spurred through that period. If you think about the rollout of a lot of the government lending programs across the world, in terms of the way that the financial institutions needed to adopt their own technology to effectively create fully digital experiences for their customers, and service volumes, which were multiple years of volumes to be serviced within two, three, four months. It just shows that the, 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 the even the largest organizations can be incredibly nimble and execute when they have to. And I think that's an incredibly important muscle to have developed and to take that and actually say, what else can we do? How can we, how can we make sure that we actually continue innovating and, and, and work away some of the bureaucracy, which in a way stifles innovation at a lot of organizations and makes you just generally slows, sl slows everything down. So I think that that's, that's clearly one, one area. The other area is the discontinuities which have happened in terms of historic correlations on previous relationships through the pandemic where let's say there was a total break in correlations to sort of the new normal as, 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 for example, in the US is emerging and other countries aren't necessarily at the same point yet. But what does that mean for acceleration of trends? Um, what does that mean for actually discontinuities where trends have actually just changed as a function of? And with, 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 any, with, with any type of volatility like that, I think that throws up opportunities. So those are a couple of macro themes for myself. Great, and Robert, um... What about yourself, especially um, what we've seen, you know, the capital markets do during this pandemic? Um, at times, it was so disconnected from sort of the economic reality on the ground for many people. Um, where where do you see the, the risks and opportunities going forward? Yeah. In fact, when, uh, when you remember uh, uh, when the pandemic kicked off, uh, one of the... Uh, uh, um, the, the, the first areas that were immediately hit were capital markets and financial markets. And, you know, one of the biggest financial risks which we could have seen did not materialize because basically uh, financial institutions, whether it's banks, whether it were payment systems, whether it was exchanges, 
were all managing, in fact, to continue operations under a remote model. And if I take just the example of the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, which is 99.9% uh, .9 international uh, overall, therefore hugely connected to the whole world, and we managed, in fact, to get uh, the exchange remote in less than 72 hours uh, for 98% of the stuff. And I must say, in fact, it worked and it continued to work all through the pandemic. So from that point of view, um, it could have created panic if financial markets or the financial system would not have, have worked overall. Now, um, what, uh, what we have seen now uh, is, of course, there are, um, there, there are huge risks, in fact, out there. What, what, what I still see is, uh, after the good news uh, just mentioned, in fact, access to capital is available, but not to everybody. So there are huge inequalities, in fact, in the market, which we have seen before. And, you know, when uh, um, and she hinted at the many organizations that did a lot of great things, in fact, basically, we saw massive amounts of money at this pandemic in order to alleviate the social impacts. And uh, when not everybody, in fact, could do so, in fact, in the same order of magnitude. And therefore, there will be inequalities um, or the gap in uh, between different uh, regions and countries that will even be uh, more important going forward. Now, let's say um, uh, there are a number of other risks which uh, I would not like to go into detail, but which one should bear in mind. It's obviously, in fact, the level of indebtedness of, of governments, uh, which we have, uh, which we will live with. Uh, asset price inflation in this pandemic uh, has accelerated, which uh, at some point in time might, uh, might hit us too. But I, um, to, to, to close, in fact, my introduction remark on, uh, on a uh, positive note, what is the opportunities in here? And in fact, uh, I think what this pandemic has shown is that um, we need to change our behavior uh, from an economic point of view, from a responsibility point of view, how we are acting overall. And I think, and uh, we have seen this, ESG has gotten an enormous boost through the pandemic. And if there's one single positive point that I would uh, single out, uh, it's this acceleration factor for ESG, uh, where uh, a broader uh, population has understood that we need to act uh, upon these various uh, elements. Great. And uh, Venka, what about you? Where, where do you see, especially um, from your vantage point uh, as an investor, where do you see the risks and opportunities? Thank you, Gina. I think risk and opportunities, uh, uh, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to uh, paint it with a common brush. So one has to see it as uh, how it impacts the developing world, the developed world, and the rest of the global south. Uh, it is true that a lot of operating models across businesses, institutions, uh, non-business institutions, whatever that might be, they have totally got tested. Uh, uh, resiliencies have been tested and resiliencies at a regional level, national level, even global level have been tested and lots of truths have come and lots of realities have been laid bare. Uh, but uh, important point is doesn't matter which part of the world, which part of uh, the sub world that one may want to pick up. Attitudes have been tested. Behaviors are going to change and people understand that there's no other option but to change. Well, that's the softer aspect, but then uh, by saying it's softer, we would be undermining the big important change. But that being said, I think pre-pandemic it itself, uh, I've been part of many of these global discussions at least for 10 years or 15 years now. Uh, the global leadership, if there's one word that describes global leadership in the last 10 years, it is uh, it, uh, the word drift explains best. Uh, I haven't really seen global leadership um, get their hands around critical issues. All that the pandemic has done has it has precipitated matters, nothing else. Uh, it hasn't changed the directions. The direction was pretty much the same. It has accelerated a few things. Now, uh, if we were to kind of go back to some very basic fundamentals and oversimplify this complicated world, this world transacts about goods, transacts about services, right? Uh, in the, a lot of international relationships 
and lots of public policy, government approaches and all are heavily influenced with the goods component because it in, involves certain physicality. And that's where some of the supply chains have been totally tested uh, for various kinds. And where I see uh, this, this whole situation leading to the big positive is uh, maybe this reality check is making the world finally uh, ad- abandon the drift and commit to certain specific courses on the way forward. And chances are in the process, we may see some big time recalibrations of the global supply chains. And later on, I would love to share as to why I feel this recalibration may actually be good for every person and every country in the world. Yeah, Yeah. great. We will uh, definitely want to get to that. Um, But kind of expanding upon sort of the risks and opportunities um, sort of related to that is, you know, who wins and who loses from this new world order? And Rishi, again, I'd like to start off with you on that question, Um, especially how different this crisis has been in the post-crisis period from the 2008 financial crisis, because we saw, you know, various ways that um, the big banks were hit, but that they were also uh, the ones that had the the scale and strength to absorb a lot of the additional regulations uh, that were put on them by uh, policymakers. And here in the United States, uh, there were a lot of complaints uh, from smaller banks and community banks about how, um, you know, hundreds and thousands of them were forced to to shut down because they couldn't absorb um, these additional regulations. We saw, you know, what housing did. Now it's the opposite, it seems. Um, So where where do you see the the winners and losers um, in this sort of post-crisis period and and how that, um, that differs from where the shakeout is from the last crisis. Sure. So I think, I mean, I think like you, like you alluded to, sort of the, the financial sector has actually not been the villain of this crisis, right? Unlike clearly the, the, the global financial crisis. Um, and, and conversely, has actually been the conduit for a lot of the government support, um, which has been given back to small businesses ac- across the world. And if you think through that, and if you take the U.S., for example, some of the largest issuers of PPP loans were actually community banks, right? Um, and within the top 10, there were several community banks um, who, who feature there. So you, you've had a general benefit to the wider sort of banking sector through, through this crisis. Um, and, and clearly, we haven't had a credit cycle yet, Right. So, so you've got all this extra liquidity in the system, which is clearly a, a massive benefit today. And, and I, I mean, I remember just talking to our own clients, is, again, especially in the US. So the, the fight for deposits was such a big thing pre-crisis, right? Now it's like everyone's sitting on way too many deposits, right? Um, so, so you've got the inverse of that. But I actually go back to, to sort of the um, uh, risks and opportunities point, which is, the, the the consumerization, as in the acceptance of a digital experience, has accelerated everywhere because all of us have got more and more used to doing things on a fully digital basis through this period. Now, that, in my view, translates into commercial lending, corporate lending, capital markets, everything. I think you end up with more consumerization of those experiences across the board. With that, I would say that actually the whole conversation which has been brought up so many times in the last three, four, five years about big tech or tech or fintech sort of really coming in and disrupting financial services and how financial services are actually delivered and consumed, I think that trend by definition gets accelerated, right? And I think we're seeing that in in, in multiple different areas. So I think that... um, I think that the the overall financial sector is is clearly come out of this well. The I mean, you just need to look at sort of bank uh, share prices, right, um, to, to get a sense of at least what, what the market's view of that is. But I do think that the acceleration of the technology trend is going to mean 
that you you have different portions of 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 the market actually hived off. I mean, one obvious example is buy now, pay later type lending, right? If you look at how that's moved to 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 fintech providers um, over over a relatively short period of time, um, that just gives you a sense of. If you if you go down the stack, um, obviously small business lending, you've had multiple players within that space. Obviously, one of them got bought by American Express uh, recently. So so again, how how that plays ultimately, but I think in a, for the customer, the experience improves uh, as a function of this, and therefore the customer is definitely a winner here, in my view. So, do you think though for the um financial services sector, or at least how we traditionally view them, um, that they are the ones who will get disrupted or will they benefit because they'll partner with some of these fintech firms, you know, like Apple and Goldman or on a credit card or, or other things, because in the end, the, the regulatory system, once you get into the banking fold, is so great that you know, a tech firm, once they see, you know, the Fed and the capital buffers and all this stuff, they're just like, oh, I don't I don't want to touch that. JP Morgan, you can have that and we'll just, you know, be your partner in this endeavor. So, look, again, great question. So if you if you play this through um, and and you sort of say to yourself, the larger banks who have the um, ability to make the investments to either build things in-house or acquire businesses, clearly will do well, right? The regional community banks is where there's a large challenge, right? And either they either they provide, find great partners to, to effectively buy in technology, right? They're not necessarily going to be the businesses which develop leading edge technology across the board. Clearly, in certain areas, they will be. Um, and in terms of making large acquisitions, again, maybe they do acquire sort of uh, t- some some of the players, but they're unlikely to make large acquisitions in the space. So I do think if you if you look at the traditional financial services sector as as banks predominantly, and you even uh, look at something like lending and just see over the last decade how much has moved away from bank to non bank lending, right? To actually say non-bank lending will be a combination between non-bank and and fintech is 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 a natural evolution. Um, clearly, clearly within Oak North, we're doing a lot to actually work with large commercial, large mid-sized and small commercial banks to actually make them competitive and if anything leapfrog sort of the innovation which which some of the largest banks are doing in-house. So they end up with a more a superior tech stack even in comparison with with the best funded institutions. Got it. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to let the audience know we're also joined uh, by Victor Gite of uh, Bitseat. Uh, hi, Victor. Thank you for joining us. I'll just bring you into the conversation um, and Robert and Venkat, I promise I will get to you as well. But um, Victor, since you're just joining us, we started off by talking about uh, some of the the risks and opportunities for uh, people in the post-COVID financial system. And we sort of related to that, that, we've also um, just been talking about the winners and losers. So I wanted to ask you that that question, you know, where you see um, sort of the haves and have nots shaking out um, as we all come out of this, uh, come out of the pandemic. Right. Thank you for, for joining all and the opportunity. Uh, basically, my perspective is that something that is not pointed very, very often is that the most important commodity in business is trust. And such trust is being moved away from traditional players that built uh, such uh, given trust uh, or guaranteed trust during the realm that they hold during the last century, right? So... People, when after, after everyone is jumping on having a phone, internet, and so on, is empowering other entities that feel that serve their interests much better, much, much efficiently than, let's say, all established powers. And this is what we've seen in the decentralization of the cryptocurrencies, 
uh, what's going on with uh, banks losing away business that they will not be able to hold, despite that they might have a superior uh, stake as, as it has been pointed here. Doesn't matter as superior is the stake, as long as the offering is not adjusted on what your clients are asking from you. And that, that role is being taken by companies such as Revolut, TransferWise, et cetera, et cetera, that you don't need to walk to a bank and just put your name literally on a paper, sit for an hour and open an account. That is what is going on in my opinion. Great. Well, uh, Venka, I wanted to ask you that question um, as well in terms of just the winners and losers, um, especially since you're, you know, t talking to all these different businesses, consulting, um, giving them advice, you know, how are you seeing their worlds shake out um, and, and who benefits and who doesn't as they move forward? Thank you, Gina. Absolutely. You know, if we try to look at the world, the canvas as a political structure or industry structure, then one can pick up winners and losers. Obviously, there are going to, there are going to be certain countries who are going to be uh, more prominent in the global order after this event because there are political undertones to this big event that has happened. So we cannot deny that. The way it plays out, of course, it's anybody's guess, but we know directionally there's an issue that has been, that, that has uh, that is brewing and we do not know how it's going to resolve. That's one. In terms of industry structures, it depends on what is the extent to which different industries and different horizontals uh, stay through with the change. So for example, over the last 18 months, lots of private sectors, corporates talked about sustaining the hybrid work model and a lot of those organizations are now reversing it. So we'll have to see. Plus, of course, there, there will be certain uh, interdependencies, for example, at a governmental level or economic level. Uh, one may want to go for the hybrid model because it has certain advantages. But, you know, in the process, certain other industries may collapse. And therefore, as an economy, you'll have to take a painful decision to let go of benefit to save some other industry. So those things are pretty complex. And therefore, if you were to get into that level of detail, it's anybody's guess. Uh, but then I would like to abstract out of this micros and get into something which is more fundamental. What I see is, I'll connect back to this whole readiness to accept change. And this readiness to accept change, not in terms of business leadership or political leadership. It is in terms of the communities and the masses. And therefore, they're questioning the logics. That's one. Second is, uh, at least two most recent generations didn't go through any major disruption. They were li literally kid -loved. Of course, there will be nuances depending on which part of the world we're talking about because there's a, certain, a big part of the world still goes through challenges and youngsters there do go through challenges. But then this is also about discontinuity and questioning the norms. And that has already been instilled in two young generations and that's going to stay at least for the next 30, 40 years. And that's going to change everything, the approaches to everything that we do. But even more fundamental, uh, given this political dimensions and this global supply chain recalibrations, I do see capital moving into a large geographic concentrations, which also have large concentrations of population. There a lot of the population is also developing or underdeveloped. And more important, those regions today, capital is relatively expensive. And therefore, today, those systems have a much higher diligence and threshold when it comes to asset choices and asset deployments and capital deployments. So there will be such compulsions which is going to drive the global leaderships uh, and which will make capital uh, move towards a different calibration, which will make capital be a bit more productive. And it will be productive in zones where you need a lot of people to be pushed up on the development curve. So chances are in the process, while there may be micro winners and losers, country level winners and losers, as a global system, I think we will be better off with this change. Well, so that's a good segue, Robert, to maybe talk about some ESG issues and um, whether we can see real structural changes as a result of that. Um, just before the pandemic hit, um, in January 2020, I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and they were all talking about ESG. Um, you know, every company was like tripping over themselves to announce like how many thousands of trees they were going to plant and all this stuff. But 
frankly, a lot of it just seemed like talk. Like everyone wanted to kind of put on a good ESG show, but whether they were actually going to do something that, you know, ate into their profit margins or, you know, their operating expenses, um, would they really put their money where their mouth is, was my big question from all of that. So, Robert, I want to ask you, uh, given now what we've been through, what, what do you see for the prospects of that, especially with the financial system? We've seen, you know, the largest asset manager, BlackRock, um, play a big role in, in some of these issues, trying to push companies. Um, banks are being pressed now about their climate change risks. Uh, where where do you see this headed and how it affects the financial system going forward? Well, thank you, Gina. Um, it, it's a question that uh, I could talk for uh, uh, an hour about. <laughs> uh, but, but maybe, in fact, uh, a, a short version of this uh, to, to give you, uh, just in the sentence, in fact, a word of background. In fact, uh, basically, I got involved in the first green bond back in 2007 that was issued by the European Investment Bank, and also the second, which was, in fact, issued by the World Bank in 2008. And, and you remember, in fact, that green bonds are uh, a, a sideshow, in fact, a minor sideshow in capital markets for a long time. And, in fact, things changed when the Paris Agreement in 2015, in fact, was signed, where it looked like the world got together, in fact, to say we need to act uh, uh, concretely on climate issues. And the uh, the reaction that I had with my team on the Luxembourg Stock Exchange was to say, well, when we are looking at what happened the years before on the green bond market, it was a minor thing, in fact, versus what happened in capital markets overall. But it was um, a trend which we, we believed uh, uh, deserved uh, a clear visibility. And that's why we created in uh, a couple of months after Paris, the Luxembourg Green Exchange, which is dedicated to only green financial uh, instruments. And in fact, a couple of days ago, we listed the 1,000th instrument on, on that. Uh, overall, 900 billion of US dollars uh, issued in the meantime. And this exchange, which is still unique today, in fact, um, uh, has a market share of more than 50% of what's being issued was worldwide. Now, I do not want to make a promotion for the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, but in fact, the point is to say when we see in the last couple of years and um, and COVID nineteen certainly has fundamentally accelerated this development. It's not only about talk anymore. Uh, asset managers, asset owners will be obliged, are obliged already when you're looking at the European Union, for example. On to report on how you implement ESG in your investment strategies. The investors need to do that. And to cut the long story short, today we are not talking only about green or social projects anymore. Companies who are issued these sustainable financial instruments, as we call them, need to have a, a very clear ESG profile. And the ESG profile means, in fact, a very clear policy a credible policy which you can communicate to the outside world where you say, in fact, who you are, what you do, what you believe in, and notably how you transition with your business model to the 2030 agenda in order to, to, to meet, in fact, the, the, the climate targets. And, you know, investors at the same time here, and uh, you mentioned the Black Hawks, but in fact, it's the Black Hawks up to the, to the individual investor who have the opportunity here, the unique chance of asking issuers, those who are uh, raising capital, what are you doing with my money? And that's the fundamental change. And that's also why I believe that in a couple of years' time, and it will not be many years, access to capital for companies or governments or financial institutions will be, be preconditioned by an ESG profile that's widely known and accepted by capital markets. And therefore, those who believe that this is just fancy, that I uh, just recruit a couple of guys, which I put in the corner, and hopefully they do not disturb, in fact, my investment business going forward. Well, you know, I, I am 
convinced that they are sitting on the wrong track and they will be, in fact, extremely surprised by the speed of how market will be changing. And that's what's happening. We, are see, we see it every day. Yeah? Well, so with these markets changing uh, and we all kind of trying to figure out um, where we go from here, uh, Richie, I wanted to ask you and, and, and the rest of the panelists as well, as we move forward, we've just gone through this once in a lifetime event that I, I don't know if anyone was, was really prepared for. Where do you see the, the threats to financial stability and resilience um, in the future? And, and what should policymakers do about that? Um, is, is there anything in terms of, I mean, there, there's talk here about um, counter cyclical buffers and you know, various other things that they uh, are trying to um, sort of forecast for. Uh, what, what do you see are the, the biggest threats to uh, resiliency, just given <laughs> that we've gone through something that no one could have really imagined and, and what should be done about it? I mean, the the obvious point is obviously the the unwind of massive fiscal support, which is being given by governments, right? Um, and how that plays through over what period that plays through um, the, the 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 sort of almost daily um, articles on on sort of the inflationary risks and what that can potentially do for rates, right? And obviously the knock-on impact of that. Your point on counter-cyclical buffers, I mean, obviously in the UK, um, there have been there has been a regime around counter-cyclical buffers, which I, I would actually say is clearly proven to be valuable um, because counter-cyclical buffers were being built up as we went into the, the pandemic. They, they, they had one more notch to go up and clearly got released um, during, during the pandemic and therefore, in, in effect, have done what they're meant to do. Um, clearly, the capital ratios of banks as they stand, for all the reasons we've just discussed earlier, are incredibly strong at the moment because they haven't gone through the credit well, haven't gone through the credit cycle. They haven't been materi- materially significant loan losses, um, again, on a, on, on, on a wide basis. So, so therefore, you, you sort of say to yourself that the resilience today is quite strong where it stands, right? Um, again, go back to the same point reflected in, in, in stock prices and the like. Um, but the but the largest the elephant in the room is absolutely the uh, the unwind of of, of all the, the the fiscal stimulus. Yeah, no, that's already uh, becoming a big question here in the United States, and I'm sure elsewhere too. Uh, Victor, I wanted to ask you, you know, and you raised the issue of of trust earlier. Um, you know, where do you see the the threats to um, resiliency and and stability going forward? given, you know, that, that trust gap. I think that one, one of the major problems uh, that the system is going to have is certain events that never were imagined before with the ability of the, everyone being interconnected. We, we saw things like Wall Street bets and the, what happened with AMC and how you can organize decentralized entities that are not financial institutions to the stabilize, destabilize people that do not expect uncertain threats. Happened the same with the pandemic. Pandemic, I, re, I recall when when the pandemic arrived, I got, I got to the to the financial reports of several listed companies, and in the uh, in the section of risk, no one ever mentioned a pandemic as a systematic risk to anything that could happen to them. And, and suddenly it, it just happened uh, in a way that it was supposed to, to be for a month, two months, three months, and a year later, we're still, we're still on that. And, and it's the same way that uh, Robert is pointing in terms of trust, I will point at the ESGs. The ESGs are going to get ratings and companies that are not ESG efficient are going to get punished by the same people that can tumble their stocks. That is my opinion. So you think the the Reddit uh, retail investor will be turning to, uh, after GameStop, they'll be turning to ESG? It's not, it's not themselves itself. It's the, the idea that if consumers can get a, a reorganized 
yeah. and are suddenly punishing certain companies and and things can win in 24 hours and just make people like Melvin Capital lose half of their fund and get rescued by by Steve and and the, and and other hedge funds. That's something that just it just a it's just a foot of something that in the next five or ten years can uh, the winning more things doesn't necessarily have to be a Reddit post could be a Twitter post could be mm, I need mean, someone just it's it just you just need the the critical mass and there's and there's no ball to do anything nowadays because if one million guys position themselves short against your company and they do it with one thousand dollars each in five minutes you're done. Yeah, no, it was amazing to see how fast that moved because um, the, the GameStop thing had been around for a little bit and then all of a sudden it just took off. Now, now, now they are um, to, to the offensive. This company was set to go nowhere. Yeah. And what happened here is that they're going to start doing acquisitions and now suddenly they have a brand and, and loyal consumers that are going to purchase whatever they do and they're going to get them involved like it was a crowdfunding, but in reality never was a crowdfunding. And the last thing that uh, I find interesting on what, what happened is that some institutional players ask and wonder, oh my God, how this could happen? Well, institutional players also get banded together to do certain things and certain rates on, on companies. So if, if, they, if they do it to you and, do it, and people that we, we, su we suppose that they do not have the expertise to do that, then there's, there's no surprise. Either. It's, just, it's just that the, the, level, the play field is being leveled and anyone with a computer can play. Well, uh, Venkat, what do you think about that um, and and your thoughts uh, about resiliency and, and the threats to it going forward? I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, meme stocks. You can, there's plenty of other things in the world. I mean, you had talked about, um, you know, the develop versus developing world and, and how that's shaken out. I don't know if that's part of your thoughts, but, you know, what do you think are, are the biggest threats? Yes, you know, but those stock markets are definitely indicative because at the end of the day, the purpose, the long term purpose is global well-being and every human being on Earth needs to be pulled into this global well-being narrative. But that global well-being right now, like it or not, the prime fuel that driving or is supposed to drive the global well-being is global finance. Now, one has to understand we are in a very integrated world, whether we like it or not, that's not going to go away anywhere. Now, the question is, what is happening with that global capital? And one such indication is what's happening in the U.S. with some of those meme stocks or whatever that might be. Now, I'll just give you two random examples and I'll try to kind of connect them together. Uh, you look at an auto ancillary firm in U.S., which has about, say, 12 manufacturing locations, is 35 years old, has a very secure customer base. It's pretty stable. You are not really discovering new technology. Supply chains are stable. And take a similar example, let's say, from India. I, I very deliberately pick up India and U.S. Uh, because they operate in very similar regimes in several ways, to say. Now, uh, if I were to really look at the fundamental resilience of those two businesses and the financial resilience, given the environments they operate in, chances are that U.S. auto ancillary business is financially very high and in terms of comfort levels with investors, although its fundamental resilience is heavily questionable. Whereas the same business in India is very fundamentally strong in terms of the basic mechanics, uh, operating details of the business. However, it's operating in a very different financial regime and therefore decisions are very, very skewed. And I think that's, that's, that's a very important point that one has to understand. Uh, but that being said, at the end of the day, we are, as I said, we are in a very integrated world. Uh, there's one more example I do wish to take. We all talk about ESG, green funding, and this discussion is on and uh, Robert did share how certain amounts of funds are being mobilized. And this conversation, I think, for quite some time. But in the last seven or eight years, I just want to give one particular data point, solar energy. In seven years, India moved from five gigawatts to 40 gigawatts of capacities on ground even as the rest of the world is talking. And this whole process was achieved completely outside of this global financial conversation. It was a governmental initiative. So much so that today, coal-fired power plants are no more in contention. It's already happened in seven years. So therefore, there is, there is certain conversations, one part of the world, and then there is certain execution has already been done in the second part of the world. This is not even 
planning. This is hard facts, right? And now the same conversations are moving to how to manage, how to create a new industry which can manage solar panel scrap. So we already moved into a derivative issue right now. So the question is, yes, we do want to build systemic resilience. The systemic resilience has to be, of course, in the global financial system. But then the point is, what is the underlying of this global financial system and how resilient might that be? And that's where I feel the essential operating model, which is driving the world. I think that is where a lot of attention needs to go into. And I'll go back to my initial point is the political responses, the political uh, concerns that have emanated from the pandemic and specifically the way this conversation about Quad has been going on with Australia, Japan, US and India. There's something very pertinent out there because Australia, Japan and India and Asia, uh, Australia and Japan are developed economies. Japan and US have lots of resources. India is one sixth of the global population. A lot of them still struggling, just about three to four trillion dollar of economy. Now, here is where a very interesting possibility can get created and where I feel that a lot of global production, global servicing will move into a different configuration when lots of fundamental issues of the world can be resolved. But I have a strong warning here as well. If we can, this is still the same old model that we are replicating with new names. This may create a same problem with different color and different texture and tone. What might be more helpful is uh, now that the world understands that the past hasn't really worked and the new has to be something different, though nobody knows what might be the different. I have a suggestion to make. The suggestion would be that can we make a very organized attempt to have what I call it as clustered production of goods and services around the world in such a way that there's no region in the world which can totally say I cannot depend on some other regions, which what we call it is mutually indispensable clustered production of services and goods. And if you layer the global financial architecture on top of that, chances are that we may have a more sustainable way of growing. When I say sustainable, which is politically sustainable, which is sustainable by, by means of this millennium development goals or the sustainable development goals, not just pertaining to environment, but even basic human indices, human indices. So, of course, it's it's sort of a huge leap of faith. I'm not very sure I'm going to see that change tomorrow or maybe in my own lifetime. But I know directionally we have to go somewhere in that direction. Great. Well, Robert, um, in the few minutes we have left, I'll let you have the last word on on this front, on, on the threats and um, what you uh, see in terms of possible storm clouds. Um, and, you know, Venkat mentioned... Uh, supply chains and, and trying to create something more sustainable. But we've also seen tensions grow in the world on that front. I mean, I was just following this morning, um, President Biden talked about a supply chain strike force uh, that's going to, you know, possibly hit uh, countries like China if they've done certain things that have hollowed out, you know, chip supplies or various other things. Um, what what do you see as, as a threat to financial stability going forward? Well, in fact, what, what uh, you mentioned now, in fact, means, in fact, basically less globalization and uh, everybody will try to uh, organize. In fact, every country will try uh, to organize itself and prepare better, in fact, for this type of extreme situation if and when it then uh, reappears uh, under a similar form or in a different form in the future. But, um, but in fact, one element which I find very important uh, with respect to the financial system. That's, we talked about the acceleration of the digitalization processes and so on, and innovation that keeps on going, uh, making progress in financial services. This makes, in fact, uh, cyber security or rather cyber insecurity one of the major threats, in fact, which, which, which I see, in fact, basically. And um, uh, in, my, in my environment, in the exchange world, we have seen this. Only a couple of months ago, the New Zealand exchange, in fact, was basically taken hostage by a cyber attack. And in fact, you, you, sh you see, in fact, that all of your systems, in fact, which we managed to get basically into home office in a couple of days only, in fact, are, uh, that, that, that's, that's a minor achievement versus how do you fend off the uh, much more sophisticated and ever sophisticated threats, in fact, which are coming from cyber. And that, of course, um, uh, the more you're going into digitalization, the more you need to uh, ring fans, uh, whatever that means, um, uh, in, in that aspect. 
maybe one word um, about um, uh, not a threat necessarily, but a missed opportunity. A missed opportunity could be if overall, and it's also linking to the supply chain uh, question, if we were trying to throw, in fact, billions of dollars or euros or whatever currency at the economies in order to uh, get back to business as usual, rather than, in fact, building back better. In fact, that's extremely important of uh, creating a perspective also to one, uh, one part of the population which I feel, in fact, suffers the most, is, uh, is, uh, despite the fact that they are not really on the radar, that's the young people. Uh, and we made the link, in fact, to the financial crisis. In fact, the young people were the most hit in the financial crisis 10 years ago. And in fact, uh, this uh, pandemic here, in fact, uh, does, not, um, does not help them either. So from that point of view, I think we have uh, enormous challenge and enormous work to do under these various aspects uh, going forward. Yes, no, we, we definitely have um, a lot of things uh, to address in the future. But as you pointed out, and as uh, our current president likes to say, hopefully some of it will be built back better. Um, I want to thank our audience for joining all of us. And thank you to the panelists for um, this really interesting uh, discussion. And um, I'm sure we'll have uh, more to talk about this in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Thank you Victor. Bye-bye.